Welcome to Dubai Science Park um, uh, uh, Advanced Health event. This is the first uh, event that we're hosting here in the in our stand. Of course, we're doing this with our partners, uh, Connect Communications and Synapse, both presented by Tom and Marcus. Um, and today we're talking about a, a very important topic, uh, a topic that everyone wants to know the, the future of and also how is it going to impact the healthcare industry. Uh, where, where to now, healthcare data in the UAE and beyond. So I have an um, esteemed uh, panelist here with me, uh, starting on my left with Dr. Uh, Mazen Ghadir, uh, Director of Partnerships, Client Relationships and Bid Management with IQVIA. Uh, Dr. Osama Al Hassan, uh, Health Informatics Specialist with Dubai Health Authority. And last but not least, uh, Samir Hawa, Head of Healthcare Middle East North Africa with Amazon Web Services. Now, I'll, I'll ask the burning question first because we want that to be out of the way. <laughs> and that question is for Dr. Osama. When are we gonna see the amendment of the ICT law? <laughs> Thank you very much for the difficult question. Uh, the amendment is already out to all the regulators, and I believe it should be coming into our official websites very soon. Uh, it's still in Arabic, not translated to English, so this could be another challenge. Maybe it will take some few weeks to be translated. However, the direction is very clear. Uh, within this addendum, uh, there are almost around nine types of exemptions that will be provided to the to healthcare providers, insurance, uh, that can allow them to, to have a way out of the article number 13 in, in the ICT law, which is dedicated to data residency. Uh, and they were saying that data cannot be developed or, uh, or, or generated or exchanged acro uh, across the borders of UAE. Uh, I can see that most of these exemptions are, are uh, if I can put them in, in general uh, uh, items. So mainly there is one for research, so one, there's another one for insurance companies uh, dealing with, with e-claims because we realize that may, most of those uh, insurance companies have operations and they develop uh, and, and they depend on infrastructure that can cannot be brought to, to the UAE easily. It will be huge investment of them. And even some processes, like I can say, uh, patient risk scoring or whatever, or some AI-based solutions, cannot be developed on top of a small set of data. It should be done with, with a huge number of, of tables of data. And the only way to do this is approach. Is there, is there an amount on the investment? So for example, if I am a, a device company that I have some sort of a, a heart pacer that is very specialized. We, we and didn't have only mention anything about, but it was just a window for the regulator to assess okay. and give the exemption. But right. we need, what's going to happen eventually is that everyone should come up with a business case and privacy case together, combined, saying I'm using, I want to exchange this data for this reason. And we put the nine reasons. So the nine reasons could be either uh, research, if we're doing incorporating research, if you want to uh, send a patient for, like I say, pa treating patient abroad is one use case. Having a second opinion, for example, could be part of that. But this will be related to the patient concept. So here we're talking about individual data exchange for a patient, for telehealth, for second opinion, for whatever. This will be approved as a protocol rather than case by case. So I have a, so we could be an American hospital in Sharjah, for example. I have an agreement with Mayo Clinic in US to for a second opinion protocol. So then you will get approval for the entire protocol, provided that you encrypt the data, you get the consent of the patient, whatever. So we will look into the protocol and approve. Uh, there is another uh, use case I remember around uh, sending data to international organization like WHO or whatever. So this could be another use case. Um, so as I said, so mainly it would be treatment abroad, telehealth. Telehealth is a, is a specific one. 
it's a specific exemption and uh, even we give some yeah and we give some sort of ability to external user coming from us or whatever to log into our systems as well and look into the data okay the excellent excellent i think uh, this is really just a, a testament to how the government here in the uae has an open door and and an open mind as well you know they um, i have received so many people coming to me saying that you know the when the law was out in 2019 that you know this is not the spirit of the uae uae is all about collaboration uh, you know best practices um, and this you know has is really a good show uh, um, you know a showcase that the uae government does listen does take into account consideration from the private sector why because you know they want companies to thrive to grow to do more business um, so so yes we're all looking forward maybe i can add one point so i think that with after this addendum the law now is, le is leveraged to a better situation where we can allow investors to come and, and to 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 do business in a, in a seamless way maybe there is two issues left within the ICT law, and I've, I'm receiving a lot of questions around them. So mainly is the data re uh, retention uh, restriction, because the law says explici explicitly that data should, the health data should be saved for 25 years. And for some companies, this is a huge investment. So I think that uh, the, 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 the law itself was talking about medical record, not healthcare data. So not every healthcare data should be kept for 25 years and i believe that all the regulators will come up with 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 more policies that describe this piece saying which data pieces of data will be kept for 25 years and there are some data should be kept even more than 25 years so, so this i think will, will leave a, 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 a lot of uh, room for the investors with regard to digital health care platform to have some sort of good uh, good investment Uh, so this this is the main uh, part. Uh, Samir, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll put you under the um, microscope as well on the spot. So, isn't this bad news for for AWS UAE? Because is the AWS? I mean, this law was is a great news for you, for Azure, and for the likes. You know, data to be stored here. But now with this flexibility people don't really, I mean, they still need to localize their data, but you know, with some exceptions. How do you look at this? I would say it's good news and bad news. I mean, this is a major step in the right direction. Um, so just to share a little bit of history with you, AWS has been in the region for now for several years. As you may know, we, we launched uh, our first region in Bahrain uh, in 2019. And more recently, we announced that we're going to launch a region in, uh, in UAE which is scheduled to launch next year. So we're, we're excited about the prospects of working closely with the healthcare industry. Of course, there is an interim period between now and then where this issue of data residency does come up. I think what's, what's missing for us, uh, first of all, it's good to hear a little bit of the clarity on, on the rules. Of course, I'd love to see the, the details behind it because the details matter. Uh, in my view, if we look at the UAE in particular over the last you know, 10 years plus, we've seen a massive uh, proliferation of the use of EMRs, uh, HIEs, and now device connectivity, not only on the hospital side, but more recently with the consumer side. And now with the with the recent pandemic, we also have, you know, telehealth being adopted. And that was a cultural, there's a big cultural shift. So what you're seeing is that there's a huge amount of data going into healthcare that wasn't occurring before. And for governments, for DHA and the likes to be able to use this data, uh, really the, the, the value of, of using cloud and the AI and machine learning capabilities that the cloud vendors have is unlike anything that you will most likely find in the region. Uh, the biggest challenge we have, I would say, is related to the issue of, of security, data residency. There's always a concern about security and, the, you know, and there's a lack of clarity between data residency and data localization. And I think what's missing today is, is a couple of things. One is data classification, because not all healthcare data is, is, is alike. So for example, you touched on the issue of research. 
I've had a number of conversations with uh, research institutes over the last couple of years since I, since I joined AWS. Everyone is keen to leverage cloud, and there are many tools in cloud that can be leveraged for, for example, you know, oncology imaging uh, analysis and, and all sorts of, as we did with the pandemic last year. And these are things that are going to be very costly for the local providers to do on site with their own hardware, etc. So really, there is a, a strong value to leverage AWS, Azure, and all the other cloud providers. So I think the you know it's good news that we're heading in this direction. I think there's still some work to be done with regards to classification. So if you look at the uh, the federal authorities like in Anisa, Adda, and Desk that manage the data classifications, there is today there's a gap between the healthcare regulators and the the regulators um, uh, that manage data. So that mapping of data has to occur in order for us to really be clear about what can and cannot reside in cloud. But I, I think it's a step in the right direction. There is. Um, there's a lot we can do. We're keen on, uh, on starting with me. We, we, we're really keen on getting things off the ground, of course. And I think there are things that we can do in the interim, even between now and the launch of the region in UAE, where we can do test and dev environments for, for research or anonymized data. But again, even anonymized data, I think the, the, the rules around uh, anonymization and pseudonymization are, are not clear yet. So that that part of the regulation has to mature. Dr. Mazen, as they say that data is the new oil. So what do you think of the new amendments to the law? Are you excited at Acuvia? Can you do more services around it? Can you connect to more uh, you know, uh, sites or industries or? Uh... Uh, thank you for that question, Marwan. Uh, and, and I think, um... Uh, because uh, we are seeing um, uh, a dramatic change uh, in the post-COVID-19 period, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the era uh, of, of disruption. So now um, there is a huge push towards hyper-legislation. So the amendment is uh, a beginning uh, of, uh, it's the first drop of, uh, of, of uh, let's say, the, the, the rain that would come afterwards of protocols, approvals and whatnot. But from IQV perspective, as a human data science uh, organization, um, we are seeing um, data uh, uh, reinventing economies. You know, a consumption economies like the economies like the UAE that consumed is transforming into a production and much more. Um, um, uh, re they are the focus on R and D. So as data becomes more and more. Uh, uh, the oil and the, the, the center focus of governments. Regulators are, are moving, healthcare regulators, and I like what Samir said, between the, the interjection between health regulators and data regulators, where Smart Dubai, for example, if you look at how Smart Dubai has come in and tried to bring in digital and the focus on data closer to the government entities, specifically Dubai Health Authority, we, for example, in IQVIA, we are working now to see similar entities appearing. So, for example, in Saudi Arabia, we cover around 57 countries in this region. In Saudi Arabia, they have the Saudi Data Artificial Intelligence Authority. Uh, there is also Mohammed bin Zayed uh, Artificial Intelligence University. Um, um, Department of Health in Abu Dhabi, they are no longer talking about data science. They are talking about decision science platforms. So. The fact that now is definitely what you're looking at is categorization of data, democratization of data, um, standardization of data. You're looking at uh, data consumption. Uh, as maturity, uh, uh, I guess, maturity grows in the region, and specifically in the UAE, uh, bodied and coupled with hyper legislation, amendments such as the, uh, the, the, uh, the amendment to the ICT data law. There are a lot of... Um, excitement that would come in, data privatization and confidentiality, anonymization, uh, data um, standardization, that are tools that are gonna come uh, into play now. And a lot of HIE projects are happening at the same time. So there's mission mash of data coming in from all over, not just within healthcare industry. We are noticing now inter-industrial uh, data exchange between aviation, hospitality, and healthcare. And this is bringing in a lot more um, anomalies when it comes to data. Uh, I think Dr. Osama will comment with the gap in data science and skills 
and the actual requirement for bringing up uh, local resources. No longer do we actually export data scientists uh, because of COVID restriction from India or Egypt. I mean, that could become the next reality is how you grow them internally because every country and every economy is becoming more and more protective of their talent from India to China, uh, to um, uh, Egypt, to North Africa and whatnot, to, for example, GCC. So there is a lot of, a lot of moving parts from handling data, from bringing the skills, uh, working with partners like AWS and Azure, working with partners like the EMR companies that are becoming more and more acquainted with real world evidence, with data, which becomes a, a reality uh, of a region that is transforming into value-based care, driven healthcare, looking at different data inputs from social uh, determinants of health, behavioral health. And this is what I think um, uh, IQVIA could bring in, working with pharma, working with clinical trials, where data has been always the oil for pharma for the last 70 years. This is uh, it's very great. And I think if there are any young people out there uh, figuring, thinking what to study, I think they should be data scientists because that's really the future. Maybe you need to add with data scientists as well, uh, privacy and security experts. You know, this is a very rare profession that we need to find a lot of compliance experts, uh, what we call privacy officers experts. These types of jobs will be highly in demand in the coming few months because of this uh, law. Just for the audience, because, you know, in terms of decision making on, on laws, we have a lot of things that are that happens on a federal level, which then boils down to a local government. So is this the same with the ICT law? Was it done on a, on a ministerial level and then it's given to local uh, health authorities to give more feedback or is it how, how was this uh, this done the law making process was based on consensus so all the regulators were uh, well represented in the committee every all the drafts that we generated we usually go uh, go back and forth between regulators legal teams technical teams it took us almost seven years to generate the ict law so it was a very lengthy process and the same for the executive regulation and for this addendum so actually, there's a consensus. We, we, make sh we made sure during the process that there will always be two levels. So we have generic high level articles, but that can be uh, interpreted and implemented on, on, on the ground through the, the regulators. So th we have two levels all the time. Can I add? So and, and I think what Dr. Osama is, is also adding to this uh, 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 the access to data where consent management has become the biggest headache now for any uh, digital ecosystem. Who gets to say who accesses what, when, where? Um, one of the presidential candidates in the US came up with a, a great idea of actually uh, monetizing for the patient whenever data is used, right? So they actually can make up money in the US. Uh, uh, one, one, of the, one of the policies that, the, the policies that uh, the, the presidential candidates came up with is that the patient will own the data and every time healthcare providers, payers, pharma would actually touch it, they will actually get, get a percentage or, uh, you know, some, so, so that, these kind of ideas were not even thought of a few years ago. And now with the, with the liberalization of, and, and the, the huge governance drive to bring in data um, um, closer uh, to the stakeholders, you, you, you can add a different and additional layer where you look at the patient uh, uh, control of data. What sort of uh, ideas would you actually give in and how can they monetize? We were talking the other day about sandboxing data. Let me just ask the audience here, who should own the data? Own the data. Is it the patient, your doctor, your insurance? Let's get a few answers. I don't think I'm sure the UAE law does regulate any sort of con consent provisions in the law. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge gap when it comes to consent. Yeah. That's point number one. Point number two, we're all talking about data, but <laughs> I'm sure in the UAE, there's no precise definition between personal data and personal health mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we need to get a clear understanding and definition of what data really means to then get a consent provision. So let's start from the basis and then go up to the roof. That's what I think.
first and foremost, the patient has to be uh, an yeah. integral part of that. The patient always owns the data and who becomes a steward and a caretaker of that data as a partner to that. Um, but I, I think you can't be just one sole owner necessarily. Okay. And the kind of definition of the uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my own comments. I think the question is set for the personal information. It's a very complex issue. You have companies who have the data who can sell to manufacturers, the suppliers, and some data like others who can make money from ads or whatever. So the key to be regulated is very, very, very sick. Of course, thank you. Yes. So I would agree that patient data, when it is identifiable data, is certainly owned by the patient. In the case of de-identifying data for the purpose of research for the greater good and public health, I think I think that is, is an exception when it's outside of the patient ownership, yeah. and it enables us to move towards globalization and precision medicine. So yeah. And from a regulatory, obviously regulatory needs to put boundaries around it, but it's no longer patient owned. I just want to take the, the liberty of maybe plugging something from AWS. So last year with the pandemic, of course, we have something called the AWS Data Exchange, which Pro, uh, allows providers to have access to third-party data sets, and they're all anonymized, as, as, as Michelle said. And really, this, this ex ex access to very broad and global data sets has given uh, a lot of researchers and, and, and the likes of Moderna and others an ability to accelerate development of vaccines. Uh, we also have something called an open data exchange, which, which provides free uh, free access to open data sets, and really these are, you know, these are tools that any one of us can use globally that ex help us accelerate the, the, the research and development of, of care. So I think it's absolutely crucial. The ownership of, of, of data, in my view, should should reside with the, with the person themselves, and whether to opt in or out is is their decision. Now, to to Michelle's point, I think it does, you know, it should be anonymized uh, for for sure, but. Really, that's I think that's one provision that could help us tremendously, and I, it's interesting because for this for UAE in particular, we've already been approached by other governments um, in the region who are willing to share their data sets with the UAE government for research purposes. So um, it's uh, your next door neighbors that we talked about earlier. So it's it's an interesting development, but I think it's something that that benefits everybody. Thank you very much. I agree with most of the people. I think that the ownership as a concept is an old fashioned. It's, it's not really applicable anymore. It's more of custodian or stewardship plus complex rules of access. And even this is, this could be even reaching to the deletion of data. Do I have a patient uh, a right to delete my record from a hospital or from a population health or from a public health record? This will be different. We need also to look into the use case of, of, of accessing the data, whether this is for my own new, uh, health, uh, supporting my health, or for secondary use, which could be research or something else. So I think we need to look at those angles. There's also another angle some people don't, don't uh, look at, which is that there is some sort of IP for me as a hospital or the healthcare to collect your data, put them in a fashionable way, in a meaningful way. This is a cost that I put as a, as a healthcare regulator or, or a healthcare provider. So I need, I have some sort of, some ownership on this data and this should be respected as well. Samir, back to you. Now I know AWS, AWS invested in Bahrain with the data center and now in the UAE. Um, you know, we're, we're very happy that AWS is here, but is there a movement? We are too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Is the, are gov do governments now around the world want to localize more and more of their data? I mean, why is this phenomenon happening? I, I think there are multiple reasons for this. So some some reasons are related to data residency laws and 
and some governments trying to protect that uh, that data residency. There is also issues of latency, for example. So in some industries, the latency of having a data center very close to to the business is absolutely critical. For example, the financial industry. So that that plays a massive role. Uh, of course, there's also the issue of investments and, and, and fostering kind of the the ecosystem in terms of workforce that comes into play. So. What we do is when we look at new markets that we enter, we look at the whole story. It's a, it's a business case, basically. We look at the, the opportunity to work with the markets, but we also look at how, how we can foster growing that uh, ecosystem around healthcare. And interestingly, it's, someone reminded me of a quote that Dr. Osama made, and this is an old one. I don't know if this is still true, but apparently 10 years ago, so you told somebody, uh, someone told me this this morning, 10 years ago, you told somebody that only 3% of the uh, healthcare informaticists in the region are locals and nationals. I don't know if this is still yeah. the case. It's not just the case, but the number is not that. Probably close. So what, what, what we try to do is we, we try to help the, the region in, in kind of developing those bioinformaticists, the data scientists that require, you know, that are required to, to elevate uh, or, or, or benefit from the cloud. So, so you know, it, it's... That's really, it's not a very simple decision to just say we want a data center here. There are multiple factors that go into it, uh, business case, uh, financials, politics, etc. My question is in regards to cloud-hosted solution, digitalized solutions in the region. When do we foresee that the data, whether it's health data or other data, is allowed to be hosted on one hub? AWS or something else in the region, Saudi, Bahrain, UAE, etc. Do we see that happening, or will it still be a copy of the cloud for each company, each region? Interestingly, I think from a from Nasdaq standpoint, or for the, from the financial sector standpoint, uh, as far as I know, DIFC is probably one of the few entities that has uh, fairly good clarity with regards to data residency. So. Uh, one of the, and you, uh, Dr. Osama might need to help me on this with GDPR, but some of the provisions of GDPR in Europe state that if you are able to host your data in, um, in countries that at least have the same level of safeguards as a certain standard, then it's okay. And DIFC is actually one of, one of the, I would say, one of the more mature regulations in countries. So from, a, from NASDAQ standpoint, you know, really, it could be anywhere uh, that falls into that bucket. And I, 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 I know there are a list of countries that are approved uh, as per DIFC laws. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't carry over to healthcare just yet. But my, my feeling is, you know, as the regulations mature, I would hope that that GDPR philosophy is adopted across the board because there's no reason why, why we couldn't leverage, uh, you know, centers in Europe or elsewhere that uphold those very, very rigid standards of security, encryption, and, and compliance that, that, that are needed for healthcare or finance or other industries. Yeah, I think maybe the, the only way out of this situation is to have a general privacy law for the UAE. And I believe maybe this is something on the table now discussed at the top level in the government. But once it's out, then we can be at the level where we can be, can say, masking GDPR because we have something similar or equal to it. And maybe maybe to add to that as well, um, you probably need to look at it uh, from another angle. Now data, uh, or specifically health data, is a matter of national security. So if you want to put one thing and, um, or let's say establish a platform for GCC, you probably look at that very interesting point. You need to look at the viability of that uh, and obviously uh, uh, as you said earlier, there's epidemiological data or data that is attributed to epi uh, epidemiology. Uh, where would you put that, for example? Would you put it, put it at a GCC level because you're tackling an epidemic? Uh, what, meanwhile, maybe you want the cancer data on a lower level, on a very segregated model, because you probably want to you know, uh, do some sort of uh, localized uh, um, um, care plan, perhaps. So uh, very interesting, actually. I, I would definitely... I mean, uh, look at how um, how now as we speak, uh, for example, Abu Dhabi is working uh, through G42. G42 is building their cloud services through Huawei, right? Qatar is building uh, AWS, uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure. 
right? Saudi has got a, like a, a, a number of. So again, wh how would you how would you unify that? Could you actually put all the data? Would you actually put just a segment of data to tackle under the GCC, for example, CDC to tackle epidemiology and uh, epidemics, right? Would you bring in the? I mean. Sometimes I do question also in IQV, we have access to a billion anonymized medical records, but they are, they're sitting in multiple different clouds. But when you go and do administer clinical trials, where would you, would you need to put that on a localized instant? Would you actually just, uh, you know, have to be governed by the law of, uh, of the land? But that's a very valid point. So absolutely. I'd like to kind of follow up on what you just said, um, Dr. Osama. As the UAE has taken ownership of, of SDG3 um, for providing a physician for every patient, is there an opportunity for the UAE to set the gold standard for, for defining different levels of data and requirements for protection? Um, as you, as you drive towards that. Uh, so within the context of telehealth or outside of the context of telehealth? In the context of data going across borders, because as the UAE becomes a global telehealth leader in providing access, universal access to healthcare, it seems that you would want to set the gold standard, have it recognized by an international body like the UN, that, uh, that then enables data to come from any country in the world into the UAE securely. Is that something that is on the horizon? I think I agree with you. The, the good thing about the ICT law itself, the applicability of ICT law is about healthcare services provided within the UAE. So if there is something, we're talking about patients coming from outside or the, 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 the telehealth, for example, use case have been implemented outside of the UAE, it can easily flow to the, to the UAE uh, data centers or whatever without any restrictions. So the restrictions is only about the data which are applied to patients within UAE. So this could be another opportunity for us. I totally agree with you. So we can be up for services happening in Africa or in Asia or whatever. So this could be a good opportunity. And, and, and maybe what, what you will see at the moment, some disruption to that, uh, uh, that would allow for that. Because, uh, for example, the e-passport, the IATA approved e-passport, it allows fluidity of data across when it comes to epidemiology, right? Uh, you, you will see a lot of disruption to the concepts that, okay, we should allow telemedicine, telehealth, you know, we have lack of radiology experts, right? Um, do we need to actually bring in, um, you know, um, use tele, telehealth or look at allow data access uh, you know to do the reading and, and generate reports from abroad for example right Samir I again going back to you in terms of cyber attacks and, and we know that it's very relevant what does AWS do to you know prevent or to safeguard the the data that is uh, posted here or even globally? So for us, security is job zero. I mean, we have uh, millions of customers around the world and tens of thousands of partners. And, you know, we wouldn't have those customers and partners without the trust that we have behind our cybersecurity measures. So I think just from a scale point, uh, looking at uh, we have, what is it, 200, uh, 200 plus uh, availability zones globally now. And it's you know, the, the scale that we have allows us to really take extreme measures in terms of cybersecurity. So my, my view is that what we can do from a security standpoint will really uh, exceed anything that can be done on a smaller scale by a local host or by, by a hospital on its own uh, because we have that scale and we have uh, multiple ISO certifications and, and, and security measures. You know, keep in mind that some of our clients in the U.S., for example, are national security clients. So there's a, there's a good reason why they, they trust us with their data um, uh, to, to you know to take care of them. So I have I have no doubt that uh, our cybersecurity measures are are as good as they can get. Very good, excellent. Any more questions from the audience? My earlier question about um, unintended consequences in some respect, you answered it with uh, in the context of the Saudi Arabia and the UAE being the hub for data that comes from there. Take as an example. Um, the patient's um, radiologic exam is read in the U.S. or read in England, and an interpretation is brought back here. 
as you repeat that over and over again across the multiple providers and payers, across all sorts of borders, you arrive at an end result where the view of the whole patient is somewhat fragmented. Now, it may not be ICT's responsibility to unwind that, um, but uh, what opportunities do you see to avoid that kind of thing? You think population health management uh, will eventually come when the physician wants the entire view of the whole patient. Uh, so if um, I can ask uh, that question, what do you see are some of the opportunities to make that happen? Thank you. Maybe we can look at this from the value-based care uh, point of view. So making sure that all those people who are looking to the, the services and who's paying it, they should be obliged to massage the data and make the, make the data more meaningful for better care. So I think taking it from the insurance side will, will, will support, it, uh, support a lot what we are trying to say or trying to achieve. This will be uh, the, 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 the responsibility for people who are managing it from the value-based care. They need to make it more meaningful so it will be also more cost effective and more uh, getting more of the outpatient, uh, uh, outcomes from the healthcare point of view. And, and, and perhaps also related to a concept that I learned from Dr. Osama, what we call the minimum relevant data to make the right decision, right? It's just like innovation concepts that I learned from Ahmed, minimum viable products, MVPs, right? So if you're a clinician, you need the minimum amount, what is the minimum amount of data that you need to make that right decision? So that would enable you to actually determine how much of that would you need, whether it's population health, you know, now there is the huge concept of behavioral health that you're bringing in, social determinants of health. They don't call it internet of medical things no more. They call it internet of behavioral things, right? So, so again, your question is absolutely valid and, and it brings us back to the point that what with is the minimum set of data points that a clinician based on the case uh, would need to actually have, physician, nurse and whatnot, Right, and from a population health perspective, what, how much data would you? Because you don't want to overburden. Too much data is 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 overburdening as well. So there's a there's a fine line between too much and too little, right? So, but that's a fantastic question. Ahmed, my question is Apple's recent announcement on making uh, the personal health records available for EMI subjects, all scripts, and surveys, and so on. Two, uh, two questions. How does that work in the UAE within the current data law? And the second question is how, how would that um, tackle the ownership of one that you were discussing? So I didn't get the question. So what, what about the announcement? I didn't get so the announcement says that uh, moving forward, you will be able as a patient to have your Apple uh, health app and all the health records of yours at the fingertip to send it to uh, physicians to look at your data. So, so are you referring to the non blocking rules of the US? Because this, That's my question. Yeah. How would that work here? Can you even then well, it, so if we apply it in the UAE, so this will open up a lot of. Actually, now we are seeing all the hospitals now are investing a lot of money on building patient portals. Not because of rules, because of competition. So everyone, every hospital today wants to keep their patients, and the only way to do that to have a better patient journey and pay a better patient relationship. The only way to that to do that is through patient portals. And the next page, uh, phase after patient portal is to reach to the level to be on your, how can I say, like your app, reaching whatever data that's generated by the hospital to be under your, your finger, fingertips. So this is something is coming, not by regulation, by, by, by the right of patients. The interesting thing for me is that we, you know, with the advent of, of, of EMRs and HIEs coming about, we. The ultimate goal is to move to population health and proactive care and preventative care. And we're asking the consumer to get involved with healthcare and take ownership of their own healthcare. So the things like uh, the, the Apple Watches, etc., this is really owned by the consumer. And, and that's, that goes back to the question of ownership, who owns the data and who has the right to decide what to do with the data. So I really think that that component is a critical part of that journey as we, as we head towards population health because that that enables the consumer, the healthcare consumer, to really take ownership, which is what we want, in order to reduce the cost uh, for the healthcare system. Samir, since you have the mic, um, and we're running out of time, and, I don't, and the, the audience can interact with you uh, directly later, what would be your closing remarks in terms of 
AWS starting here in the UAE, working with the local authorities and moving into the future. As I said, you know, we, we just announced the, the region coming. We're launching early next year. Uh, there's a lot of things, uh, there's been a lot of buzz around the announcement, so we're very excited to work with uh, many of you who are sitting in the audience today. And, and there, there is, I have a couple of asks uh, of, of everyone, you know, get to know AWS Healthcare, because many people know AWS as a cloud provider, but we really do a tremendous amount of work in healthcare. We work with regulators, uh, providers, we've, we've done things in research and genomics, and we have tremendous successes, especially over the last year with the pandemic. So we have a huge host of, of use cases that I'm sure would be impressive to many. So get to know us, understand what we can do and how we can help you. We have a philosophy of working backwards from, uh, from our, our customers' pain points. So we really try to engage and understand what are the challenges that you have and then work backwards to a, a technical solution that can, that can work for you. Uh, and and the, you know, the services that we provide on our platform are what we call Lego blocks or building blocks. So you can put them together in a multitude of ways to serve a specific need. And we do this directly with, partner, with customers or with our partners. So we can, we can really cater to anything across the spectrum of, of the healthcare ecosystem. So I'm keen to get engaged, of course, as soon as possible. Um, there are things that, and you, you know, many things move slowly in the healthcare industry, so it takes time to, to get some of the bigger initiatives off the ground. So I, I think we can engage now, and by the time the region is up and running next year, early next year, uh, we're ready to go. So that's my ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Osama, there is a lot of excitement around the amendments, when it will be out, and there are some rumors that it might be out this week. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> but. What, what do you want to tell people? I've read that there's a new, newly published book by John Halamka, who's one of the gurus of health informatics in the world, the clinical informatics. The name of the book is The, the Digital Reconstruction of Health. The Re Reconstruction of Health, just published last month. Uh, it starts with a very nice statement that applies actually to what's happening now. So he says is there are very rare times when technology policy and urgency of change converge. And we are living one of those rare times. Yeah. Everybody wants to, to move on. Everyone realize that digital health platforms will be the, the future. We need to liberate the usage of data, but we need also to respect the, the privacy and the security of patients. I think we are heading toward this goal. Thank you, thank you. Mazen, the last few words for you. Uh, get skilled up, <laughs> build your skills. I think uh, the next few years with the disruption that has happened in the post COVID-19 has uh, brought in a lot of digitization and uh, uh, related uh, activity. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's definitely, it's a very exciting period to watch out uh, for uh, the needed skills. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, act, I mean, I guess, disruption that is happening in the healthcare. Um, Abu Dhabi leading the way with some examples. Al Husun is an example of disruption. Now you cannot even get into a mall if you're not vaccinated. And how do you know that? It's through your mobile. So it's happening around us and behind us, in front of us. So I think I think the, my advice to the audience: uh, skill up. Uh, I think uh, with uh, with with all what's coming up, I think there will be a huge need for uh, for skilled workforce for. Uh, uh, a capability and flexibility to unlearn and learn. And I think that's where it is. There's a lot of uh, playground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, with that, I'd like to uh, um, thank all the panelists for your contribution. And it was great having you. And thank you also for the audience, those who are listening. Thank you. <laughs>